All right. We're going to have a very short presentation on fusion. That's it, is it? That was it. <laughs> Thank you very much. First thing to know is if you have a really crappy laptop, you cannot run fusion at the same time with a projector. So get a high-res projector. Get a very high-res projector or get a Mac and MacBook or something. So I'm going to go really quick now, even though I'm told not to go fast. Blackmagic Fusion. Uh, it was formerly called Ion Fusion, which was a Canadian company based in Toronto, and it's post-production image compositing software. That means after they're done filming, they do a bunch of graphical magic after. It's typically used to mean visual effects and digital compositing. Everyone always seems to have history of things, so I thought I need to do this too. Uh, I'll truncate it fast. In 1987, it was an in-house app. In 1996, it was released on Windows to the public, Digital Fusion 1.0. In 98, they had network rendering and After Effects plugin support. In 2002, they released 3.1, which had 3D particle system. It had, had a bunch of other stuff too. This is just the stuff that I thought was quasi neat. Uh, in the same year, they released 4.0 and they had a scripting language. So you could actually program stuff in there. In 2005, Fusion 5.2 came out and it had external Python scripting. The year after that, they had 64-bit and this is when I first discovered it. I started playing with Fusion on Windows, and it was only available on Windows at the time. Uh, a year later, they had stereo display, um, and at this time, you could, have, you could buy it for $4,000 each, and you had a physical dongle they had to plug in, so it was, or you illegally obtained it. And there was a student version, which is what I used, um, and it had like watermarking all over, so when you went to try and get a job or something, yeah, you would see the watermark, but if you want to use it for post-production, you had to bring it to someone that actually had the legal version. Then something happened. Blackmagic, this other company, I believe they're Australian, acquired Fusion from Ion, and they were talking about they're going to make a Mac and a Linux version. And in the year 2014, they made a free version, which was quite new, that you could actually do everything without watermarking. It's like it was missing things like stereoscopic 3D and a bunch of other network rendering tools that only big studios could really do anyway. Then in 2016, Fusion 8.2 came out, they made a Macintosh version, and they made a Linux version, which is the whole reason I'm actually here, because it's, what does this have to do with Linux? It just now runs on Linux, albeit a little poorly, but. <laughs> and you, there's a free version, which is what I run on mine, or, a $995 version in the US for student for Fusion Studio, which has a bunch of extra kind of stuff. Then a year later, they have a newer version called Fusion 9, adds in virtual reality and all that kind of stuff, and the studio version is now only $300. Mm -hmm. I still just run the free 8.2 version. <laughs> Things you'll miss out if you don't want to pay the 300 bucks Optical flow tools, stereoscopic 3D, retiming and stabilization, third party open visual effects plugin support. That one hurts actually. Plugins I like a lot because I'm actually lazy when I do things. Um, if you don't use a plugin, you have to do a lot more work. Um, it's like almost like pre compiled code, if you could think of it that way. And you get to run network rendering, which doesn't matter to me because I don't have a bunch of network farms at home. So I stick with the free thing. What is visual effects? Blah, 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 blah. It's basically uh, anything digitally, well, we'll call it digitally, altered after it's done. So if someone is in a film and they actually have little blood or like a squib shooting out of them, that's called a practical effect. If they throw it in after the fact and make green stuff come out or whatever, that's a visual effect. And there's 2Ds and 3Ds. If anyone here was thinking, you know, like the double Ds was gonna mean something else, has nothing to do with big batteries. I'm sorry, it just means it's two planes that it really deals in. 3D being three planes. The software actually does 3D and I had no intention of showing you the 3D part because it's pretty complicated. Uh, I should probably just skip past all this. It's just basically definitions of things that you don't care about at the moment because we're running out of time. Uh, keying. One thing that's interesting, if you ever heard of a thing called the Foundry's Nuke, Autodesk Flame, Apple Shake, Autodesk Toxic or Combustion, 
Blender, and maybe Houdini to a sort of effect. <laughs> Almost anything with a violet name, it seems like, does something somewhat similar. And there's also Adobe After Effects, which the end, re end result is somewhat similar, but it does it more in a layer-based system. This does something called node-based system, which hopefully I could show you what it sort of looks like. There's the websites for more information. That's probably it. And now I'll switch to the Mac, because the Mac runs it. Yeah, tactical laptop switch. <coughs> laptop two. And we'll close it off. Ooh. installation's really easy, seeing how you did it in like 10 minutes. It's ins it, installation is super easy if you have an Atom at home. <laughs> <laughs> the installation really was double click on the installer, hit next, type my password in, and wait. That was it. So this can be awesome. This is sort of the workflow area where you'll have things like this that they call nodes, which are tools, and they'll combine together. This is a viewer. This is another viewer. It is quite common to have like three or four monitors actually hooked up when you do it because you'll want to have a whole have a whole bunch of different nodes in here. Kind of like think of it like code, except it's graphical. And actually, much like the way I program, it looks very spaghetti like after if you're not uh, disciplined. And then you'll have different views. This is one view, this is another view. Where's my other view? They go up here. And a lot of times you'll throw the end result or something on a separate monitor because you want to get really uh, not down. <coughs> Keyboard commands are going to be a little different. There we go. Yep. Want to view and all those kind of fun things. So let's do something, how much time we got? Let's do something quickly neat. Um, we got a girl here who does some stuff, and she's in front of a green screen. Often you'll, you may have heard of a green screen or a blue screen that's used because we want to mat out where she is or the stuff behind her. And they pick green or blue because that's like the opposite of human flesh colors. If we were green aliens, we would probably use red screens or something. So... What are the crosses for? The crosses are actually used for tracking often as well. I could try and show that tracking is, well, maybe I'll do that right now. You know what? It's for stabilization or showing things. So if I'm, where did my, so the first time I've done it on a Mac, so it looks a little different. Where's my tools? We're gonna attach something called a tracker. So you see, here's the node, node one points to this thing here. There's this tracker here. And its whole job is to basically say, everything in this middle box, I'm going to try and follow. And the dotted box is where it's going to look when it gets lost. So if I go, yeah, because cameras will shake, but I am going to, let's close this up. So. This is me tracking, actually, you know what? Let's show the tracker there. It is now cycling through this animated sequence of pictures. Now, often what's done, at least in the olden days, and still my days, they use sequential pictures. So it'll be like JPEGs or TIFFs, because things like uh, AVIs, MPEGs, uh, QuickTime movies aren't really good in here because they're when you change from one system to another Things get messed up like Apple QuickTime. It has some smart features that auto adjust gamma So on one computer, it'll look one way and it'll look brighter on a different computer and you don't want that so a lot of times they'll just have a Single tiff for every single frame that's shown on there and most films show 24 frames per second So there's 24 still pictures for every second down at the bottom here is actually literally the, um, the frames that are on. So we're on frame 9, 10, 11, 12, stuff like that. 
So what happened now is I actually have... So with references of a movie frame versus a video frame. A movie frame versus a video frame? Your movie frame is 24 frames a second. Your video frame is, I believe, 30. Like, yeah, 29.97 or 30? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's when you get weird things like uh, two, three pull down and stuff like that to try and convert between the two. Most, most movies and most stuff now are moving to 24 frames per second, but in the olden days, even the olden days, I'm not that old, um, it got really complicated. Everything was like 29.97 or 30 frames per second. Then you had interlacing problems, and I'm going to get off track real quick. I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> the problem is I didn't get to start on time. So we have a tracker, and we could actually do something weird with it. I'm going to try and load up another image of any still image that I could find. Art spaceship sounds perfect. Come on. So I have a spaceship, and actually, quite luckily, this spaceship right now has an alpha channel. So you see these checkered thingies right here? That means there's no data there. If I, well, it, it basically means it could go over top of things without having to map them out, which I could show a map out after, but this saves time for me. So I am going to take a merge. So basically taking, come on, baby. I'm basically saying put the, the spaceship over top of this picture of the girl here. There it is. Now. Big girl. <laughs> it's a very tiny alien. And I could do something weird. Like I'm going to now connect. So now it is actually the tracker that we had for that X. The spaceship is actually going to follow it. And we can move it around, but that's often used to either stabilize things or to just keep things cover close thing, by. Cover things up. Cover things up. Um, oh, porks. <laughs> well, it also looks like it's moving with her rather than, than being locked into position. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or Trevor's face when he walks in front of the mug camera. <laughs> I mean, we all That's how you did it. So I am going to do we have uh, Maybe you just replace it with an alien head next time. You could. Now there's things it's called map. Actually, you know what? Let's cheat twice. This is basically saying we want to erase chroma keys. So I'm basically saying stuff that looks like this green that I'm highlighting, why is it not going away? There we go. The checkered screen means it's disappearing. So this is how we sort of do green screening as so we grab a bunch of the green stuff off. And there's also other ways of doing it that are sometimes better, like say Prime Map. Select, well actually, Auto Compute, I think it'll probably do it quite nicely. Oh, yeah, I did. And then there's a bunch of other fine tuning things because there's always going to be a little green stuff close to our hair, but we won't worry about that right now. And what we could do with her is just a sure. This is a picture of a nice background. So we are going to put that, no, put this one over top, come on. The red little things are outputs that I'm trying to touch here. You want to put them to the merge, right? Yeah. Well, and, um, that's a shortcut way of merging. I should have done the other way. But. So basically I'm saying take this picture here and put over top of here. And I'll pump that up here, and we got ourselves this. <laughs> we got ourselves a girl. Let's make being threatened by a spaceship in a desert. Or she arrived in a spaceship. Okay. 
presentation. Cool. And actually, that, that's a good thought. If I want to say make this thing teleport. <laughs> I would, okay, I'm gonna create some fast noise. There's a tool that does. Oh, okay. Fast noise? Yeah, it's, it's a tool that creates things. There's, I should have gone through the tools. There, this is a list of tools where you'll spend a lot of your time. Um, it reminds me of Photoshop. Yeah. So it's, it's Star yeah, this is a lot like. Transporter effect. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that's what I was, I was kind of thinking of. Okay. But these are... Various tools. There's 3D stuff. There's different ways of blurring, which is probably self-explanatory. Different ways of... Different, different ways of merging things. This is a creator. Uh, different film effects. Uh, does that have a JJ Abrams effect? <laughs> there, there would be plugins for that. So if plugins. you buy, if you buy the, the studio version, you could get certain plugins. Is that, does it have a built-in lens flare? <laughs> That's it. Probably does. Yeah. Uh, oh, I know there was a. Uh, I had a plugin that had it in an older version. <laughs> lens flare. Effector light. <coughs> Hotspot highlights, rays, shadows. Do that. Yeah. I'm going to create some fast noise. So here's some fast noise. And I am going to, what do I do? Move this down. Let's, hate having to think fast. Let's put fast noise over top of this. Think slow. I'm going to do a B spline masking. Basically saying, I only want this fast noise to come into this sort of circly area that I'm doing right now. And then you could see I was really lazy making my Superman staticky corners, so I could do something like. Smooth it out. I could make a sort of a soft edge. You're probably familiar with that in Photoshop. So if I go, let's, uh, and then there's key animations. Yeah. So I'm on frame zero. I'm basically going to say, turn the blend of the spaceship to To zero. And, come on. <coughs> and by the end, I'm going to turn the blend up to one. And for the fast noise, <coughs> start off at zero. Crank it up, and I don't know, somewhere around here, turn it off again. And we'll see what happens. Got our hero girl <coughs> running, little teleportation thing, and spaceship magically appears. <laughs> This would be known as uh, not a theatrical release. <laughs> it's an indie film. <laughs> it's done like that on purpose. You wouldn't understand. Excuse me, suspension of disbelief. <laughs> I'm going to see if I could just cut ahead. You did not copy those files. Yep. 
That one I added graffiti to. So, kill it. Of course. These are called particle emitters. I didn't really want to even show them, but it was one of the first things I clicked. These are actually randomly generated objects. So little dots, and I click on emitter, and it's going to say how many. There's 4,000. I can make it less, change on the fly, are actually created along a certain plane. And they have a certain lifespan, how long they want to live. Let's make them live longer. And in the variance, because not everything's going to live exactly 261 things. They're going to, oh, it's cut off here, whatever. So this adds a lot more realistic organic life to things. So it'll be used for water or for fire or for smoke. The smoke one's actually this better. This is actually rendering on the fly, right? Yep. I'll stop right now. In fact, this is a turbulence. These are different things that will affect these particles that are created. And I'm going to change my X strength a little bit more, and it should blow. Let's get this thing a little after it recalculates. Directional force. So now you guys spin wheel. Part of the part of the reason I didn't want to do particles, especially on a laptop, is it's very CPU intensive. Mm -hmm. That's why. <laughs> is there a tool to match noise? Uh, so if I do like a an animated graphic for Blender, <coughs> and I have also real video footage. Yes. Can you? Is there an easy tool to match like the noise levels so they look like the same footage? Mm -hmm. Uh, I find a tool. There is like film grain. Yeah, that kind of thing. Looks like between two different clips from different sources. That one's actually quite common. I have to do that with, uh, with, with many films because if things look too perfect, the human eye detects it. So yeah, so it'll, you could change the size of it. Size of it. Oh, yeah. Strength. Until they sort of both match nicely. Tone it down. A lot of times you'll put extra grain on like this and then you'll take the blur. And just smooth things out, although you can't see as much, but yeah, blurs yeah. do blurs. Not that much, maybe. <clears throat> mm. Then somebody goes and plays it on one of those new 8K TVs, and they're like, I don't know what that guy did. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, those no lines. Trying to play with this. Part of the problem when it saves all the file locations, it is uh, oh. absolute paths. Yeah. So I may have to shift around with some loaders. Let's see. Green screen, come on. 
green screen to make. So there's a girl. Come with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is that the same girl? That's a different girl. Okay. That one's on a much cleaner green screen. Yeah, okay. Fusion mug, mug logo, let's see. I'm just refinding the files. Uh, might be all I need on this. All right, so basically we got a girl here, and then we mat out the background. We want to put her in this store here. <coughs> there she is. Uh -huh. We also did a little tracking thing. So you could see, can you see it better? The tracker that I ran before, I ran on her finger, just very roughly, because I was just testing out. And this is the track that she goes. So if I were to go like this, see her hand sort of follows a path. And now that I have that path, we could do a bunch of stuff with it. Oh, my God. Oh. I didn't actually get her to actually draw it. I was kind of faking it, but. Uh... I'll, I'll take one of those. <laughs> So I glowed her hand somewhat. And she's almost touching the mug logo. <laughs> and that was pure coincidence. There's other ways of actually getting her to draw it and stuff, but it takes a little bit longer. And... But if we don't like her being there, a lot of the stuff that's done is like green screening or cutting things out. <coughs> Could be something as simple as, let's see. I got about five minutes. Well, you, can, you can go up for another 15. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. 15 minutes. We'll, we'll get up and leave and report. <laughs> Next girl. <Yeah>. Next girl. <laughs> so, um, see if I could do this. This is also a common thing. Again, I'm just going to refine where they are. I'm gunshot straight. When you're working on the same computer, you don't have to rechange your files, but relational file saving would be nice. What am I looking for? Farmhouse. Are there options for GPU rendering too? There are, yeah. yeah. Actually, the newer ones, I think from 7 and up, do uh, GPU. So, Uh-oh, I may not have copied that one. Right. So when you're working with sets of, of frames, with like TIFF or JPEG, uh, on average, how big are your clip sets in terms of data? How much are you usually working with? Uh, when when you are doing this, you're working with the highest resolution possible, and you're actually usually working uncompressed. Yeah. So depending on uh, the length of the scene, it, it can get up to like 300 gigabytes. So that's sort of typical. That Somewhat. Yeah. I mean, they, they they also get a lot smaller too. That's maybe the the larger I work with. But as resolutions get bigger and bigger, the files get bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay. So suddenly, Thunderbolt three starts to make sense. Oh, this will not. You mentioned network stacks too. You what kind of stacks does it support on a network? Stacks. Yeah, the um, studios. Like I think there's like Opus Effects in Winnipeg if they still exist. They used to be uh, Frantic Films. They have a you know 20, 30 different render servers. So while this is rendering, which 
takes a while. The stuff I'm showing is quite simple, but other ones are really mathematically CPU intensive. They just kind of thread out all the different operations to different render farms, and then they bring the information back. I've never worked with a render farm myself, but it's supposed to make things faster. Thinkbox, I, I'm not familiar with Thinkbox. Oh, okay, I heard of them, but I don't know really anything about them. I do know Frantic, and I think Visual Opus use uh, Fusion, among a couple other softwares. Yeah. So remember, Robert actually wrote the interface and the engines to actually deploy those things out to different uh, stack systems in different uh, environments. So when it was a whatever engine out there. Oh. Dang it. I didn't copy that over. What I want to do is throw in some gunshot stuff. Let's see. You know what? Where's that girl? Right there. I'm going to get her to shoot a gun. Usually, people have a gun already when they're uh, filming it, but she's, she's got, got finger gun. Yeah. she's got magical yeah. fingers. Oh, that's not it. Oh, she's got a real big gun. <laughs> so these kind of things happen whenever actors are actually shooting blanks, nothing really comes out, and then afterwards they're going to add them in. There, bang, little muzzle flash, then they'll add in hopefully some smoke. Smokes way over to the side. Brightness and blur. Hey, there's a lot of shit going on. Yeah. <laughs> Bang. <laughs> deadly, deadly girl. And smoke. Yeah. And then they'll have things like, oh no, we got this little Mac thing in the background. And of course, they don't have authorization for it. So they will. <coughs> Rotoscope you're talking about? We could, yeah. Oh, that's all right. Oh. Rotoscope it out or various other ways. I'm going to be the dirt cheap way and just blur it. 
because um, this indie film is over budget. <laughs> <laughs> I will say pretty much almost every single thing I worked on was for free, and then they got pretty cheaper from there. Cheaper from there. <laughs> <laughs> I. Uh, I basically started doing this because I wanted to be in other people's films as an actor and they were trying to get visual effects stuff done and I kind of knew computers a little bit and I said well hey I could help you out with that and if you put me in your movies yeah. <laughs> pretty much and they said yeah but can you blur yourself out for VFX, if not acting. Yeah. Yeah, right. He's been killed in every movie he's worked on. <laughs> he's the red shirt guy. <laughs> There's something. No. Is there a good online community for this, like YouTube tutorials and forums and stuff? Honestly, no, <laughs> although it, it is getting much better. When it was Ion Fusion, it was really, really, really tough to find any information on it. Um, my information was kind of, because I had some friends that actually worked at Phronic, and so they kind of helped me out with live some- Live tutorials. Live tutorials, and uh, there's, there's, paid, there's a website called CMI VFX, okay. and they don't do just Fusion, they do Houdini and Blender and Maya, and, everything under the sun um, but it's all paid now um, but they're lifetime subscriptions and there are a couple other places that i discovered just last night when i was trying to find something to do <laughs> gunshot screen screens i don't want to do 3ds particle text and the particles in there Hey, is this useful for like animating um, logos and, and text and stuff like that? Or is this mostly for or taking videos and multiple videos and working? More for multiple videos, but it can't. I have animated text. I'm going to even try a little bit here. Um, it's slower than After Effects, especially for like live stuff. But it it can be done. An example here is. The word mug has a quick little logo, and we're going to make it, oh, come on. A little smoky. And I had a bunch of other text effects, because I actually did a bunch for logos where they switch around in 3D and all that kind of yeah. stuff, but I can't show you that now. My heart, I, as... Trevor showed me, or told me before I did this presentation, because it's my first presentation, and he said, things are gonna go terribly, terribly wrong. <laughs> I didn't believe him at all. Because <laughs> I, have, I have a whole hard drive from 2006 to 2009, because that's, it's been like 10 years since I've really used this software. I had a whole bunch of files on there backed up, and I went to copy them over on the weekend, because you know I do this really ahead of time and it wouldn't power up. It's an external hard drive. So I then took the hard drive out of its case and I installed it into my desktop and turned it on in a nice SATA connection. And literal, like this, smoke came out of the hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> and I blamed Trevor because he was correct. Uh, <laughs> things were going sideways. So I was like searching through all my other hard drives for anything I could use and copy over. Oh, as it turns out, um, the Linux version of uh, Fusion does not support, or at least mine hasn't been supporting QuickTime or even AVI files. Oh. Even though the operating system itself was playing it, it, w it would not render to it. It's probably licensing reasons, but I don't honestly know the real answer. Whereas the Windows one, it did. So that was kind of tough because I saved a lot of those files into like QuickTimes and all that for easier transportation. Many years ago, I bought a hard drive at a used computer store, and they had, there was one chip on it, and it had the label Fireball on it. 
quantum. <laughs> and I plugged it in, but I plugged it into a computer that was open. I, did, I took the case off because I wanted to see how it worked. And I got it running. <laughs> And then I noticed this this actual flame, like a cigarette lighter, <laughs> coming off of the chip. <laughs> and uh, well, I had a paperweight. The drive didn't work, but I had a paperweight. In 1994. I think that was a special security feature where they would no. delete their <laughs> No, they took their name too seriously. And set the rest of the computer on fire, you know. And, now, 1994 or thereabouts is when quantum fireballs hit the market, and uh, as far as I know, I still have the record for arming the same drive seven times in a row. We've <laughs> already <laughs> got one that didn't overheat and burn up. Hey, Terry, are you going to show us some of the tempests? I was trying. That was the uh, gunshot stuff. Um, I could try again. Because that was the most recent stuff that I had done. Seventh RMA replacement drive. Unfortunately, what I I don't have the pictures. There was a picture of a girl, there were two different girls, and it merges. Basically, if you ever seen anything warp into another thing, these are terrible pictures, but you can see here what happens. A pretty quick warp. There's this thing called grid warping. Oh, yeah. And they well, stay on that. They move. So as you're you're showing picture A, and you basically take the eyeballs and sort of match the nose and the mouth, and you match that to the same thing of the other picture, and then sort of move them so they're aligned together. And as you're doing that, you change, you know, like a dissolve kind of thing, and you'll get this effect, which is a lot cooler when it's a face and not these <laughs> things. Yeah. So you manually set the points you want to try and merge this point to that point from yeah. the two. Yeah. It'll be in uh, these little... Uh, <laughs> make things look all weird. If only I had that picture. You have to do it manually or it interpolates from start to point, start point to end? You have to do it manually, but there's two answers to that. This one is manual. Because um, there's no plugins, and at least on, uh, if you pay money, and I know on version six there's a plugin that does the morphing automatically. It's just basically point to the eyes and the various things of faces, and it takes care of all the math for you. But this new version doesn't have any plugins, so we have to do it the old-fashioned way. Let's see if I could find any Tempest Tormentum stuff at all. It's possible that that's just my Mac. <laughs> Let's close some of these files. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, Apple was definitely thinking of video producers when they limited the maximum amount of RAM on the MacBook Pro to 16 gigabytes. Hmm. And so More than you could ever want. <laughs> <laughs> My theory is that they looked at their trend lines uh, across the industry and went, well, nobody orders Max with more than like eight gigs of RAM. <laughs> <laughs> because you charge a small yeah. fortune for RAM. No one ever needs more than 64 gigs. It's not that I don't want more RAM. I'm just going to go buy it third party and slap it in. Thank you very much. Didn't Bill Gates say nobody will ever need more than Mm -hmm. No, he never actually day. said that. Oh, yeah. is it a bit? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure he does. No, no, he yeah. said something misattributed. He said something that has been misconstrued to me. Okay, this is. When I first bought my first computer, like in the late 80s, it had 640K of RAM. And I was an IBM PC clone at 8086. Uh, you know, we, and um, what happened when people said, what do you need so much memory for? You know, I've only got 48K or something like this, you know? Mm -hmm. 
doing video editing. That's why you needed that much. What are you missing from this one? This this is a uh, oh, I'll let it play through. This looks like a post rendered file. So I was really hoping to add the whole composition to show you the adding of the various things, but right now it's caching all the files, so it goes really slow. But this is just a quick time file, which doesn't work on a Linux version, but Apple seems to play the QuickTime files. Surprise. <laughs> I know with uh, the Adobe stuff, there are certain codecs that are only available on Mac. Mm. The, uh, the ProRes codecs, yeah. the mm. half-compressed yes. ones, are only available on Mac. That was, <laughs> that was a problem with a person I was working with before who, a lot of video editors actually use Macintoshes. And they'd give it to me in QuickTime format, and some are using ProRes, and it's like, I have a PC, and it just, it was a tough time re uh, reading it. There was certain ways around it, but okay, this is still going to go slow. Yeah. Essentially, though, this is, in this uh, output, it's just the QuickTime, this guy has a gun. He doesn't fire it. In fact, uh, like nothing comes out. But what I added was a gunshot uh, flare, some smoke, and there might be some stuff on the wall in this one. So what I would do is I'd be very soon tracking the tip of this gun, and you can see it gets tricky at times because it goes out of frame. Mm -hmm. So right when I'll be watching his finger, his finger's going to move to pull the trigger at some point. Right there, I would put a little muzzle flash. And then the frame after, I would add some smoke. And it'll kind of dissipate around. Is this? No recoil. Yeah. I'm <laughs> thinking. <laughs> very small. <laughs> 22. 22. Yeah, 22. And he, he fires a second one. And I don't know if this version has me hitting the wall. The final version has holes in the wall and dust and stuff. And I'm not seeing, oh, no, that's just regular smoke. In fact, there were some that were hitting there. And a lot of these would take hours to do, surprisingly. No, not surprisingly. <laughs> Rendering or just the actual composition? The actual composition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to have to like one frame resolution. Yeah, you get it to render while we slept. <laughs> I can't even get it to GIMP for less than an hour. <laughs> well, that's because it's a GIMP. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just to know how to put it. No, that's VI. Yeah. <laughs> that's VI. There's an actual book on Amazon, how to make oh, a VI, <laughs> or how to get out of a VIP, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Eddie, man. Huh? Yeah, how come nobody ever mentioned about how hard it is to get out of VMAX? <laughs> if you know it. Exclamation point two. That's so on this one you could see this is I was trying different versions. I'll try in different versions. Um, my friend wanted bullet holes in the wall. <coughs> this is the, the real footage. Well, minus the smoke and all that that was added. And then I decided, his first shot missed me. He's firing another one, and I think it, there, it hits right here. Get a little dust and crap coming out. What are you shooting at you? Shooting at me, because he is, he is a jerk. Something about, I, I gave a presentation for his club or something, and it went just as smoothly, and this is how it ended. They chased me out with a gun. Oh, there was a third bullet hole. Look at that. And here is where, where tracking is, is very important because if you just put, uh, let's, I wonder if I could do that right now. I'm gonna load up. Oh, no, darn. I'm gonna load up a static picture of anything. Spaceship. Awesome. <laughs> okay. There it is. How come there were no aliens in Tempest? That would have been good. I want to see him shoot the spaceship. <laughs> yeah. There's a great shot. 
As you can see, it, it stays relative to the frame this way, but the camera always moves around. Yeah, right. So this is where we would want to, you know, do some tracking. And I would actually track this bullet hole or since that never existed, I track whatever I can. And that's why these bullet holes are <clears throat> moving around like that. Would tracking be done like in the initial film? Or, or is it always post production? The answer to that is both, and it depends on a budget. If you're talking uh, big studio Hollywood kind of movies, they're really smart. They'll have, uh, even like on the green screen, like they'll think putting green screen ahead of time, they'll put X's on various places, or as you've seen, like say, like Gollum, where's a whole suit where there's dots everywhere. Those are all tracking dots. Um, the stuff that I work on though is, you know, poor lower budget stuff in Winnipeg. And they don't think of that stuff ahead of time at all. <laughs> it's more like, can you fix this for me? <laughs> so then you need to find something fairly distinct on your background that she can use as an object to track. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it changes a lot too. Mm -hmm. Like this one was tricky because... Okay, there isn't anything really distinct on that wall. Yeah. No, but it's got the bullet holes. No, but the bullet holes were, were me. Like, and you want to track the bullet holes to something on the wall, but what do you track oh, on the wall? Okay. And there's actually no real bullet holes here. So I think I, I would like... Well, you track on the uh, door frame with an offset. Yes. Okay. And there'll be a lot of offsetting and a lot of changing of where the tracker is. I really wish I had the comp to show you, but it was because, like, first I would track, say, this corner right here, and it'd be good up until here, and then I got to find something new to track. So it's like maybe this reflection, and then maybe this little notch here. Talk to the camera and tell me that exactly. Yeah. Oh, I didn't copy the other one. Or just, you know, make sure that all the filming is being done against wallpaper that's like zebra. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to end it with a kabang thing, but I uh, don't think it's kabang. Motion it's supposed to be a big kaboom. <laughs> Shattered first, 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 Marvin first, 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 It'll show, oh, come on. Can you do this for Puerto Rico tickets? <laughs> <laughs> there was a Bryce Pallister, some sort of, he's a quasi local country star guy. And we made a music video, and I don't know if this is truck or someone's truck, but this is a real license plate. And didn't we didn't want that. Mm -hmm. So what I would have done, I'll follow through. I track this. I'm going to fast forward. This is taking long. Another common one is TV screens, right? Yeah. Anytime there's a TV in a video, it's not the actual TV. <clears throat> It's it's tough to record televisions, especially mm -hmm. the older ones. They it flickers because of the frame rate. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of times they we superimpose mm -hmm. stuff on there. So essentially, I'm tracking. It's a lot easier to track it, just because it's not moving too much, and then change it to the name of the <laughs> of his music video is ready to go. I think it crops up somewhere here, but oh yeah. But a lot of things, a lot of fixing like that, or booms, or any kind of weird things get in in the shot. Oh, um, does it have? Here we go. There's a tool. 
Morphing called yeah. transform, morphing, scale, transform, warp. There's a lot of different ways of doing various things. There's also multi-point tracking where, where you track all four corners. Yes. And it, it automatically sizes your, your object. I might even be able to do that. Yeah. After Effects does that. I don't know if. This one has before. Yeah. Another thing I took is I got rid of dodge because I didn't see that disappear. Yeah. Uh, uh, this part add in and, and because copyright issues and. You can't tell, but dodge is a paper. They don't get the product placement. It's still pretty obviously a dodge, even from the rear. <laughs> but it doesn't say it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know if I'm getting the right corners even. We all want to go home and drink. So I would. See if I could load. Mm. Why not? <laughs> Spaceship is a recovering occurring theme. It's right. Usually, you take a a square looking or a rectangular looking thing, but hey, that one's not tracking too well with that. There we go. Now it's going in. Questions, guys? Next year. Thank you very much.